right, welcome back everyone. I hope you also um, took some of the coffee because this is going to be a long and packed and interesting afternoon we have for you here. Um, we are going to start with these expert flash talks. Um, we actually learned this from the uh, Science of Science conference at the Library of Congress and it worked beautifully there and what they did was to have pre-timed slides so this way um, nobody can go beyond two minutes, which is really hard. Um, I'm, I apologize to all the speakers which have to go through uh, these two minute only presentations, but this is really a way to communicate a lot of the uh, really interesting and relevant work to many. And we didn't want to have parallel sessions and therefore now we have very short um, talks. Um, this is the official sequence and then there must be a second um, slide, right? Um, so this is um, going on on the second slide. What all the speakers in this session should be doing is to memorize who is right before them. Or if you want, you could also line up. Uh, it's a little bit like kindergarten, but we can maybe trust that you can go online, find a way to go online to visit the uh, internet. And then if you forget who is before you, just, just go to the flash session talk uh, listing. And what we will do is we have these pre-timed slides, which, oh, okay, that's gonna be interesting then. <laughs> okay, so Dan is gonna have um, a timer, and then when two minutes are up, please um, uh, just um, stop talking, um, enjoy your applause, uh, and then the next speaker is gonna come up. Any questions? All right. Now, um, the issue with the Q&A is, is serious. Um, so you now have to very quickly write down whom you want to talk to after all of these uh, events are done this afternoon. So please do keep good record um, so that um, all the presentations can also be um, falling on fruitful uh, soil. Um, we are going to start with um, Matteo Convertino. And um, he is and this is the sequence after that. So I hope everybody knows who is in front of him or her. And um, first speaker's already up. We are already way ahead schedule. And um, this is a little bit about Matteo, but then it's up. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for giving me the possibility to talk. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Public Health and Engineering in Minnesota. And what I do is really, I would say, apply the complexity science. I, I have a fun in developing mathematical models, push them forward, and most of them are really based on information theoretical approaches. With the, some blend of uh, the field where I come from, which is uh, environmental engineering, eco-hydrology that is really focused on incorporating um, environmental dynamics uh, together with other uh, social and uh, uh, engineering models in order to try to guide the design of a large scale ecosystem and uh, with the purpose to control some population pattern that we want to, to, to control. So here I actually wanted to talk about the biggest uh, uh, big data problem that I really was working on for a long time and right now it has extension with the collaboration uh, with the PAHO and uh, uh, CDC mostly. So this one is really an example of uh, uh, an enhanced adaptive management problem in which we couple an eco-hydrological eco model with the decision analytical model in order to try to understand what are the relationship between this large scale uh, ecosystem which is the Everglades. So we were interested both into how different species were actually regulated by the eco-hydrological dynamics, but at the same time, we wanted to have um, a artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithm that was actually capturing both stakeholder mental models and actually the objective information coming from data. And this is just a snapshot of actually an influence diagram that was actually inferred by uh, a, a, an entropy-based model. And uh, as you can see, it couples the ecosystem dynamics and actually a bunch of outcomes that uh, measure the impact of different engineering controls on, on uh, the whole uh, ecosystem. And this, and, and this population outcome are actually weighted by uh, stakeholders' uh, preferences that establish how much each of those uh, individual outcome are actually important for uh, for different stakeholders that needs to make a decision. Oops, sorry. Um, oh, it's up. Wow. 
Okay, well, um, sure. <laughs> Question later. So hi, I'm Maria Larenas. I'm an economist working as a consultant at the Division of Biomedical Workforce Research at NIH. And I'm here trying to answer this question in two minutes. Does IF32 award have an effect on research career progression of biomedical researchers toward independent NIH funding? Uh, in the evaluation, we want to estimate the magnitude and the direction of the effect using NIH impact two administrative data. We use an NIH research project grant RPGs as an, an indicator of the subsequent NIH funding. The funding decision is not random to a stage process. First, a priority score is assigned to each application, and then a word notification is sent based on a score, institute priorities, and budget. When funding the decision is endogenous, as in this case, traditional method of estimation are not appropriate. Instead, non-experimental methods, such as regression discontinuity design, allow us to compare similar applicants, those who were funded against those who were not around the selection cutoff and obtain the effect of the program. Being below the threshold in the F32, in this case uh, zero, does not guarantee to be awarded, as you can see in the histogram. 21% uh, of the applicants who scored below the threshold were not awarded in this sample. The FASI RD design allow us to model the endogeneity and the probability to be funded. Uh, the, estimator, the estimator that we obtain here is the local average treatment effect around the cutoff point. So using, uh, sorry, okay. Uh, using a parametric estimation and several techniques, such as instrumental variable, B-probit and IV-probit, we found the recipient, uh, the receipt of a NIH F32 postdoctoral fellowship at the margin increased the probability of receiving an RPG grant in about six percentage point. Uh, these are preliminary results. Thank you. The two minutes are ready. So thank you, uh, my name is Jeroen Struben, uh, and my uh, study focuses on sustainability, market transformation, um, and what I mean with that is uh, the, initial, the development, initial adoption, and scale up of uh, market-oriented sort of product uh, categories that are more sustainable oriented. So nutritious food is one of the examples that will show uh, very low uptake, in particular in underserved uh, areas where it's needed most. Alternative fuel vehicles and other examples where uh, an organization better place funded by $900 million failed uh, miserably despite lots of excitement and launched in three countries. So what's going on? The underlying premise is, is that there's chicken and egg problems involved and everybody knows this chicken and egg problems between inf fueling infrastructure and, and adoption uh, vehicles. That's what better place uh, try to address the problem. What you need to do in order to overcome that is to push it seed enough so that you can overcome this market formation problem. The problem here, however, is that there's many of these uh, chicken and egg problems involved together. Um, I study those processes that go along different realms, including social, behavioral, and physical and economic realms, and in particular focus on the role of coordination using a range of models, modeling approaches, and data. Let me give you one example of these mechanisms. So uh, nu nutritious food or healthful food dynamics, uh, utility of the food matters, price, taste, and et cetera, but also consumer consideration, which is an endogenous process built up through uh, social influence. Um, at the same time, firms uh, develop their processes and uh, expect, uh, responding to where they expect that the markets will grow, and the market also depends on its favorable market infrastructure, distribution network, corner stores, schools that are well-educated. This is what I simulate, and the key finding of these simulations is that um, um, that mainstreaming healthful food innovation really requires cross actor sector and cross sector alignment uh, across different sectors, public and private. Um, I use these models to interact with stakeholders as well as to perform more specific data analysis, for example, on specific neighborhoods and understanding uh, mechanisms controlling for uh, of, of, of con uh, consumer consideration, controlling for other factors. Um, and in that way, I com combine data and computational analysis. Thank you very much.
So one of the challenges facing the biomedical research enterprise is that there has been an unsustainable expansion of the workforce over the past three or four decades, which has resulted in a, um, an imbalance between supply and demand. But outside of what is known as ANIC data, we lacked information on this perceived mismatch, as well as the type of skills that trainees need in order to be adequately prepared for success in the job market. So we performed a labor and skills gap analysis of the biomedical research workforce in the United States, taking traditional labor market information and pairing that with real-time job posting data. Um, we demonstrated empirically that over the past decade, there is uh, the, the supply has continued to increase as has demand, although it continues to outstrip demand. Um, there's multiple perspectives on how to really address this issue of oversupply, and we chose to focus in on the development of broader skill sets in our trainees. So from the thousands of job postings that we collected, we were able to isolate specific elements, including the technical skills as well as the professional skills that employers are requesting that their candidates possess. And we examined these both within the core biomedical research workforce as well as in occupations considered complementary to the workforce. We identified skill gap areas including project management, business acumen, communications, uh, supervision, as well as others that are outlined in our results which were published last month. So through this analysis, we were able to see that in addition to the deep technical mastery as well as the scientific education that our research trainees gain, having exposure to and proficiency in this broader set of skills will really position them for career mobility and agility as well as success in the workforce. Thank you. Well, I don't have to tell you what my title is anymore, do I? How do I? OK. Uh, <clears throat> for the last several years, our center has been working on developing an innovation index. Now, now don't everybody go to sleep, another innovation index, you know. Uh, what is interesting here for us is the research and the data that went into these various measures. Now, the index is made for practitioners, first of all. We've got simple categories for inputs and outputs. And what a user can do, though, is start drilling down into subsequent levels at more and more degree of specificity. So here we have high tech early in life cycle. Uh, the data are all county based. That's important for time series looking at regions because metro areas have their boundaries change over time. So you need to have a consistent pieces, consistent pieces to put together to aggregate uh, consistent regions. All the categories are motivated by academic research. For example, knowledge spillovers. Uh, we took a look at, you know, patent generation is a function of research and development, large brain mammals, uh, dollars. And we were interested in looking at the impact of proximity and distance to uh, a university and the degree to which proximity matters. And the conclusion is, yes, proximity does matter. The coefficients are much higher than uh, further and further away. So we had 50, 100, and 250 miles away. So now what we're looking at is trying to come up with a theory and all the necessary inputs, if you will, the recipe for innovation. And so we're looking at the regional prerequisites for uh, not only knowledge creation, but potentially knowledge using as well. So a molecule can be developed in, North, in New Jersey, but it could be manufactured, say, in Puerto Rico. So uh, all that to say is these data are all free, and I hope you grab a flyer. Sorry, I'm having a technical difficulty. OK, hey, uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'm going to speak about workforce diversity um, with the work I've done with David Bronitielski from um, GW. So really quickly, workforce diversity is key to scientific advancement. NIH funds biomedical research, but we fund people to do that research. And the le NIH leadership has articulated both in Science in 2011 and PNAS in 2015 the importance for diversity 
in advancing science. And so one, you think about the continued adequate supply of domestic research workforce. So more than half of the children born today are non-white, and half of the white ones are women. And so thinking about representation of women and minorities in science is important. And also thinking about making sure the research enterprise meets the needs of the entire population. You want to get people from all those populations. So scientists from certain under racial ethnic backgrounds um, Blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, et cetera, are underrepresented in the NIH investigator pool and the professoriate, which is where most of the people that we fund are. And even though there are challenges in comparing to population level, it just, it's a contrast that you know, roughly a third of the US population is from these populations, and less than 5% of NIH workforce is from these populations. And so these populations are termed underrepresented minorities. So usually what we try to do is this pipeline frame. So the idea is if you just get more people early on, then more will become on the market, and more will become assistant professors. And so the idea, the solution then is to get more people early on. The reality, though, is that the size of the underrepresented minority talent pool does not relate to the number of assistant professors hired in basic science departments. And so you can see, looking um, from 1980 to 2013, um, there's been a roughly seven-fold increase in the relative pool available, but that does not statistically correlate with the number of people who are hired as assistant professors each year. And that's not the case for scientists from well-represented backgrounds. And so when we think about faculty diversity, similar to that con uh, the talk from my colleague in Canada, thinking about multi actors um, report uh, needing to be a part of the um, conversation. So we built a model. It explained 80% of the variance in assistant professor hiring. And the big point was that even if there's an exponential growth in the talent pool, you're not going to get more than 8% of minorities as assistant professors unless we actually get better linkage later stages of the talent pool. And so it caused us to think more than just about the number of people, but the different actors that are at play and how they can all work together to achieve this goal. Thank you. So the idea of graph transformation is to be able to theoretically predict as well as visualize uh, different models like diffusion, ranking, uh, without actually running them. Uh, the benefit comes into two folds. First of all, we'll be able to more systematically compare different models, uh, and we'll be able to scale them to much bigger data sets. So in attempt, in collaboration with Kali, we are trying to uh, apply these methods to uh, uh, scholarly networks, in particular, uh, of this web of science data set we have at a uni. Uh, in, in this case, we're studying geo uh, locations and coarser networks. As you can, I'm sure, what I'm showing here is a very small subset of the entire uh, data set, which is have over a half a billion records. Uh, but even with just a tip of iceberg, you already see uh, sort of what you, you normally would expect, essentially, mm, Longer geo distance sort of leads to less opportunity for collaboration. In fact, if you look more closely at the numbers, uh, these two variables almost form a perfect negative one Pearson correlation. Mm. And if you look at the outlier at the very beginning, uh, guess what? Uh, it turns out p people tend to collaborate more than 90% of the time with their colleagues in the very same institution. Uh, big surprise. So with that in mind, uh, we can use these geolocations for a lot of useful things in science, science uh, study in general. So keep in mind, these are very pre preliminary findings. Uh, so one thing we can do is do entity resolution or name disambiguation uh, by transforming these sort of noisy collaboration networks by mapping them into uh, geolocations. Uh, as a simple example, the, the two caddies on the right-hand side are probably more likely to be the same person compared to two borners uh, because the collaborators shows up in the same geographic region. Another application we can potentially do uh, is trying to predict what's going to happen after you're moving to a new institution. Well, uh, we're hoping we'll be able to find these kind of patterns through these publication data uh, and even potentially build a predictive model that uh, we'll be able to give you a better sort of strategy uh, when next time you're on the job market uh, intended to move. <laughs> and uh, so keep in mind that uh, these findings so far on these is a very small subset. We are trying to verify them on, on the whole data set. And uh, if you're interested in these ideas, so please, please talk with me. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Borner. I'd like to thank everyone here, Dr. Borner and your team from Indiana University and Guru Madhavan for hosting us. I'm Bruce Hecht from Analog Devices. I want to share with you this framework for scalable sensors that applies for the internet of things and people. We've been interested in how new technologies and new products are developed and what are the models that we can use to understand how we develop these, both the own internal development of the processes, as well as working with our customers across industries to make transformation. A couple of these examples would be for smart agriculture and for internet of sensors, for collision avoidance in automobiles, for telecommunications, and for the transformation of health. What we've done is to take the framework and look across different types of development. So from the bottom of the graph, you can see developments in new manufacturing technologies. How do we turn that into IP blocks and advanced technology? We build integrated circuits, so leveraging the power of electronics, and up into modules, into software, and into systems. Some of the questions that we need to answer for ourselves is how do we decide when should we be building a brand new technology? When should we be leveraging prior technologies, and how do we make the decisions that intersect between these two. So here's an example of what this means. We take traditionally all kinds of information as analog from the world, signals uh, of different types, and we combine these. In the past, this was viewed as a supply chain, so information comes from the left, and then we process it and we make some decisions. But what's becoming increasingly important, as we've heard here today, is applying uh, smart analytics and combining both human power of intellect as well as machine intelligence. And we're interested in what will be the future of these. So two examples of technology and the kinds of decisions that we need to make. On the left-hand side, for that application in smart agriculture was the development of an initial measurement system, initial measurement unit. So this would contain initially six degrees of freedom. But over time, once we've discovered that need, we can iterate it oh, each year with better performance, with smaller size, lower power, and more degrees of freedom. On the right-hand side, here's another example of discovery. So when Rowington had accidentally put his hand and his wife's hand underneath the x-ray, they were able to see the bones. With that discovery has been many years of visualization that's enabled transformation of medicine. So we want to be prepared whether we find something new, how can we capitalize that? Or once we found it, how do we leverage it with the succession of technology? And so we'll be interested to hear from this community how we can expand that knowledge for our decisions going forward. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Masaya Arime from the University of Tokyo and also University of London. Um, in Tokyo, uh, we are part of the um, um, uh, Science for Redesigning Science um, policy, which is close to science program in the US. So um, um, basically, in recent years, the science policy makers are trying to address the societal challenges or grand challenges to justify the funding for supporting uh, research in universities. Um, <coughs> And then that the, uh, the, the one of the challenges is the uh, energy security, and also another challenge is the environmental uh, protection. So somehow combining these different challenges that the smart city is increasingly emphasized as a kind of area for uh, funding uh, research. And this is also included in one of the main uh, issues uh, in the new uh, five-year science uh, and the technology basic plan which started uh, just a few months ago in Japan. Um, so um, in the case of the uh, smart city, there are many components, um, also many different technologies, and also many different uh, uh, concerns and also interests uh, which are uh, maintained and addressed by different stakeholders. So um, this one, uh, smart city, is in a kind of uh, area where there are many trajectories available in the future. So uh, what we are going to do is to, uh, this is very preliminary, findings, but then trying to understand how these societal expectations, societal concerns are interacting with uh, supply side, um, the technology players, so that how this evolution of uh, demand and supply or uh, the source and also needs, um, they come uh, <coughs> uh, in interacting with each other to, to have a kind of different trajectories. And then that the, in the case of Japan, uh, this is just uh, again the preliminary findings. That in the case of Japan, this the application areas including EVs and the home appliances are there emphasized. But in the case of the US, it's more about uh, the uh, <coughs> physical security issues and the resilience. 
and because the network of actors and because of the, the Japanese structure, which is very uh, concentrated with the uh, big players in electronic companies, but also in the US, yes, many startup companies and also uh, many um, smart meter and the, and the uh, utilities that different uh, the industrial structures are emerging. So how uh, we are we are going now to trying to address the, how this interaction between uh, the societal concerns also technology supplies are now interacting to, to, to determine the trajectory. do this. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I am going to show you a set of, of models which are simultaneously buildings. They are full of potential. They contain persistent information. They renew themselves. And they, they serve as sketches for a demonstration of how things might become literally alive in the future for, for building systems. You can see a rather optimistic kind of environment here, here in, in, the, in the Venice installation, and a similar one here in, in Seoul. These are composed of very resilient scaffolds te using textile paradigms for the construction systems, overlaid with distributed computation, sens sensor arrays, and, and net networks of behavior scripting, overlaid again with, with synthetic biology metabolisms that run through them offering protocells, chemical exchanges, that serve as, a, as perhaps a, a prediction of how buildings could renew the environment and refresh themselves in, in the future. Through some steps towards a coupling with neurology, we also in, in involve a deeply felt kind of exchange between the human occupants and the buildings. You can see the kind of resilient scaffolds that are, that are involved in, in supporting the, these environments and something of the kind of empathetic responses of very gentle ambient motions that, that serve to amplify human occupation. Also, the weather-like like developments that, that exist at further reaches from the building in, in which small shadow plays and impressions of relationships are also, also encouraged. The work is founded on a sense of the tremendously fragile sense of emplacement that surrounds arch the architectural project in public today. The sense that the world is fragile, that the world is uncertain, but it serves to offer a kind of an optimism, seeking to have a radical kind of efflorescence and involvement through expanded sensitivity with the world. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Alina Lungiano, and I'll briefly talk about a project in which we use the computational modeling approach to study team assembly in new emerging fields. In this project, we explore the mechanism of team assembly and whether the influence of this mechanism um, changes as the field evolves. Specifically, we look at uh, teams in the oncofertility field from its inception until 2010. Uh, oncofertility is uh, the fusion of two previously disconnected disciplines, oncology and fertility. We are also interested here uh, in examining how, the, um, how this mechanism of influence are impacted by an exogenous <coughs> event, specifically which was the first, uh, the, uh, first NIH funding initiative in this field. Our approach was to first develop a theoretical model to explain the assembly based on the compositional, relational, and ecosystem mechanism. And we then combine an agent-based model with system dynamics to predict team formation and field evolution. So the agent-based model captures the bottom-up mechanism for team formation, and this trigger um, a top-down external uh, system-level intervention, which was the recognition of the field uh, through the major NIH funding initiative. And this top, um, this top down initiative, which is specified by the system dynamics, in turn changes the mechanisms for assembly which are embedded in the agent-based model. We then validated this mechanism with empirical data from the oncofertility field. And we found that the mechanism for team assembly changed dramatically after scientific field is uh, recognized as a legitimate field. We also found that uh, the NIH funding initiative had the uh, intended consequences of facilitating assembly among universities funded by this, uh, this initiative, 
but had unintended consequences of slowing down research collaboration across the larger community of uh, the field that was not funded by this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kadi, and very pleased to be here. I'll be speaking in a couple of hours about our research about temporal modeling. I rise to tell you about the book, uh, the new ABCs of research to uh, shift the models of thinking from the ill-fated, ill-considered Vannevar Bush model of 1945, Science, the Endless Frontier, which proposed this linear model that we start with basic research, go to applied, and then develop products, innovate, and then have commercial success. And that model is charming, it's clear, it's appealing, it's compelling. Unfortunately, it rarely works. And so we've been trapped, I think, for 70 years in a model that doesn't work as well. And this book is a breakout of a model to suggest the ABC, applied and basic combined. And the argument is if you take a theoretical approach, work on real problems with partners in the real world, develop a potential solution, test it in the living laboratory at scale, come back, refine your theory, publish the theory, disseminate the solution, you get the twin-win approach. And I think this can be implemented in our teaching, in the way we do research, and the way funding gets done. The book is a guide to students about how to increase the impact of their research, but it's a manifesto for you, the science policy community, and the funding agencies about how to change the models of research. We see inklings of this happening. The NSF Algorithms in the Field AITF project does specify that they encourage proposals from theoretical computer scientists and a domain expert with a practical problem. There is hope. We can change the system. Let's do it. The problems of the 21st century are important. We need to get there. Let's go. Thank you. Beautiful. So the goal of the GDO, the vision of the GDO project is to create a live open data catalog over human society, inventorying the physical events, about 300 categories of physical events from riots and protests and coups, um, on through the narratives uh, and the emotions that undergird human society and its dreams and fears. Like any good, like any good project, it begins with data, everything from a worldwide local news coverage in over 100 languages, print broadcast web, uh, special saturation coverage of certain television stations, um, academic literature to give us the why behind the what, um, books to take us backwards through time, human rights, and other catalogs to, to really in-depth catalog things. Um, and then, of course, deep learning uh, algorithms, in particular Google's algorithms, um, to add the visual narrative to all this. So the idea is essentially scooping up the world's open information uh, and processing that to try and understand human society. Of course, the majority of the world's information is published in a language other than English. Uh, this requires mass machine translating uh, 65 languages at saturation in real time as that material arrives to allow us to really penetrate to local um, perspectives around the world. So all this data coming in, being translated, what can you do with that? Um, two things. One is an event data set. So actually going through and saying, well, what is this, what is this news actually telling us this happening? Um, you know, this is describing a riot or a protest. Um, and then, of course, the narratives, the emotions, the dreams and fears, the things that undergird society, how it's reacting and conceptualizing the world around us. What can we do with this type of data? One, we can compare, say, protest intensity uh, by countries over time. Look how they, um, how they react to external stimuli. We can do things like real-time <coughs> alerts and say, within the last 15 minutes, Burundi is beginning to implode. Um, we can watch, and this is old data, so the new data is much higher resolution, but we can watch daily life go by, a riot here, a protest here, the government reacting here. Uh, we can do things like combine the physical and the emotional data to look at things like cautious optimism uh, and country stability. We can visualize everything from refugee movements uh, to, uh, uh, pro to uh, global poaching and wildlife crime to the Russian perspective on economic sanctions. We can use deep learning to look inside all that imagery, 50 million images since this January and counting, um, across the world to see how they're visually portraying things around us, to go with the textual narratives. Um, we can take 200 million articles in 65 languages, one and a half billion location references and 750 billion emotional measures, combine that to a single visualization to say, what is the news media across the world showing us of world happiness? Um, we can do forecasting. We can look at the cycles of world history, fold 300 million events on top of each other to look at what are the natural cycles and repetitions that we see, um, combine that with all kinds of other latent dimensions. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you all very, very much. Everybody can breathe again <sighs> deeply. Uh, and maybe we give another applause to all those speakers. <laughs>